Support for this podcast and the following message come from Dignity Memorial. When your celebration of life is prepaid today, your family is protected tomorrow. Planning ahead is truly one of the best gifts you can give your family. For additional information, visit DignityMemorial.com. Hello, hello. I'm Brittany Luce, and you're listening to It's Been a Minute from NPR, a show about what's going on in culture and why it doesn't happen by accident. The clear, high-pitched melody you just heard was not a bird. That wasn't a flute. That was a whistler. Allow me to introduce you to America's whistling sweetheart, Molly Lewis. And today, we're going to get all up in her mind. I've been whistling now for 30 years, probably. My parents decided to show me this documentary called Pucker Up. It's about the international whistling competition. the first time I'd ever seen professional whistlers performing classical pieces and operatic songs, and I kind of realized that I could whistle like they could, and that was quite a a realization. Since then, Molly has earned titles at some of the biggest whistling competitions in the country, including the Masters of Musical Whistling competition in L.A. And chances are, you've probably heard her before. Her whistling was featured in the Barbie movie, where she whistled the cover of Billie Eilish's What Was I Made For? She's also performed alongside rappers and indie icons like Carolyn Polachek and Karen O. And Molly isn't just whistling other people's tunes. She's making her own music, melodies that whisk you away and set you down softly. She's doing exactly that with her new album, On the Lips. And let me tell you, her music has really expanded my ideas about musical performance and gotten me to think about what it means to turn a soothing pastime into an art. I sat down with Molly in NPR's New York offices, and I feel so lucky because she didn't just welcome me into the world of whistling. She also performed some tunes live. Stick around. Molly, welcome to It's Been a Minute. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh, it's our pleasure. This is exciting. This is an auspicious day. Uh Because obviously we're going to have a chat. We're also going to hear your craft. (laughs) So many people who are going to be listening to this, you know, have had the experience of whistling. But there are very few people on earth who can whistle as you do. How does it make you feel? How does whistling make you feel? Oh, I mean, it makes me feel wonderful. It's access to this other realm. It's like another dimension, you know, Mm. being connected to music. And I kind of sometimes call it like the whistle zone because you can't smile and whistle. You can't laugh and whistle. And that was kind of the big hurdle for me. It was getting over nerves Mm. and not breaking into laughter that this is what I'm doing Mm -hmm. in front of a group of people. And so I have to concentrate very deeply. And it's quite meditative for me in this other kind of state, but I love doing it. I want to back up for a second with this whole whistling competition space. Like, tell me a bit more about that. What is it like? Well, gosh, if you've ever seen a Christopher Guest film... (laughs) (laughs) It's 
<laughs> it's like a Christopher Guest movie come to life. I cannot believe it's real. The characters, the scene. Whenever I go, I wish I had like a GoPro attached to my head <laughs> at all times because it's just surreal. There's one in Los Angeles, the Masters of Musical Whistling, and then there's one in Tokyo which I've never been to, but I'd like to go just, you know. I have a feeling you'll get there, but yeah. I I just kind of want to go to Tokyo. I, <laughs> I don't really believe in a whistling competition. What I love about whistling is the artistry, the soulfulness, the beauty, and isn't necessarily the thing that's going to win the top prize. Mm. I mean, I don't really know how the judging works. <laughs> they want you to do fly to the bumblebee or something very complex and complicated and that gets you yeah. more points but that's not necessarily what I want to listen to mm. <laughs> but I love going because it's the only time I ever get to meet other whistlers and uh, so it's <laughs> oh yeah I didn't really consider that that you're not consistently probably in a community of other whistlers like yourself no no i know ne- you know it's no i <laughs> wait so when you all get together like what is it, is it like a meeting in the minds like are you trading tips like what's happening um well what's cool about it is you know the one common denominator is whistling and it's such yeah. a diverse group of people like there's people from all over the world of all ages We definitely talk tips and tricks. Like what? Well, some whistlers swear by certain chapsticks. There's a mouth spray some whistlers use that a trumpeter invented called Chop Saver. Oh, Um, (laughs) that's a good name. (laughs) There's one whistler who she she used to put bacon grease on her lips. To um, keep the sound smooth? Just to keep the lips moist and, you know, running well. And then there's one whistler who, I, I mean, I love this story. I don't actually know if it's true, but... But apparently he didn't kiss his wife for two weeks before a competition, just in case it would bruise his lips. Oh. <laughs> I mean, on one hand, I'm like, that's real dedication. But also, I'm like, I want what they have. Like, <laughs> oh, kissing that'll bruise the lips. I, I know. He that's had to be passion. careful. Exactly. <laughs> but that's incredible. That must be such a specific feeling to, like, spend your life whistling, as I'm sure many of these other people do, and then to finally be among your people. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting experience finally getting to, like, have these conversations Just that I specific never feeling. get to have with anyone else um, about this very niche thing that we're all strangely into. <laughs> well, you've got this incredible new album called On the Lips, and you're known for doing, like, whistle kind of lounge music. Mm-hmm. Very atmospheric, moody and slinky in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And I, I wonder, what's a word that describes the feeling you want to evoke making your lounge whistle music? Hmm. Gosh. I like people to feel enchanted or moody. <laughs> Something that takes you out of the world and puts you into an atmosphere that brings feelings, longing and a mystery and yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I will say listening to the songs from On the Lips, especially what's my jam? Silhouette. Oh. Um, <laughs> you feel like you're in like a jazz bar. Like it has a very kind of cozy but cosmopolitan feel to it that just really feels like it's coming through very clearly in the music. Oh, well, thank you. My concept for the album was I wanted it to feel like a live show of mine that you walk into Mm -hmm. and you sit down and there's the introduction to the record and a kind of an ebb and flow of different feeling songs, but a couple covers like we do at the live show. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we even experimented with adding clapping in between the songs just to kind of make it like a fake live experience. <laughs> but I, mean, I don't know, we scrapped that. <laughs> but I'm glad that comes across still anyway. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You know, it's interesting. Like you have these beautifully composed, fully produced songs uh, of whistling. But that's very different from how many people in the everyday sense experience whistling. Like many people whistle, including myself. In a way that's similar to, like, fidgeting, like, kind of as a form of, like, self-soothing or, like, something they're just doing absentmindedly, you know? I wonder, what's it been like to professionalize this craft? Well, 
I liken it to humming or, you know, it's something you can mm-hmm. walk down the street doing absentmindedly. I think it's more the explaining I have to do mm-hmm. a lot because people do not associate whistling with something refined and professional or mm-hmm. seriously musical. Mm-hmm. So I think that's my crusade, <laughs> just mm-hmm. like getting whistling to be known as something beautiful and not just like, that annoying thing your neighbor's doing <laughs> too often. One of my first jobs when I was, I don't know, in my early 20s, I was not well adapted yet to working in an office with others. And a habit that I did not realize that I had until it was pointed out to me was that I whistled when I was like doing emails or just looking at things all the time. And I had this coworker, a slightly older woman, Evelyn, she was super sweet. But she said, a whistling woman and a crowing hen will always come to some bad end. Oh Have you heard that one? I I have. No one's ever said that to me. I I don't imagine that they would. (laughs) Yeah, but I've heard that. Yeah, there's some superstitions about whistling. Someone did yell at me on the street once, like, whistling attracts ghosts. And I was like, (laughs) oh, um, excuse excuse me? What? And there's a a theater superstition. You're not supposed to whistle in a theater, I think. Um, I used to work at a... I've never heard that one. Yeah, that's one I heard. Although, you know, I I definitely have whistled in theaters. So far, I think it actually is probably doing a lot of good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There have been some whistling superstitions, but yeah, I I definitely don't take too much heed. (laughs) (laughs) Nor should you, nor should you. Okay. You said in Rolling Stone, people hear whistling and they think it's annoying or shrill or twee. It's often done in a very earwormy kind of way that doesn't necessarily highlight the instrument. It can be really beautiful and soulful. And... I have to say, no, this is me talking now. I have to say that I I agree with you. I think that's really true. Like in a lot of pop music, whistling, when it's employed, can be one of my least favorite parts. It just feels like it's not being used in a way that it could be used, especially when I think about the kind of music that you make. Why do you think that kind of employment of whistling in pop music, or what do you think people are doing wrong when they do that? Well, I think it's being used as a catchy little earworm hook. It's always a little bit jingly or cheesy, and then it gets stuck in people's heads because that's what it's meant to do. (laughs) And then everyone hates that whistle bit. (laughs) You know, I know why they, people use it in this way. I just, but yeah, this is what I fight against (laughs) because this is what people think of when they think of whistling and music. (laughs) I mean, I love whistling, love whistling. I come from a whistling family. I whistle, my dad, cousins, uncle, we all whistle, and we got it from my late grandfather. Whistling was so much a part of who he was that when he passed away, we all whistled at his funeral because it it actually would have been weird not to. Uh, There's something that's like deeply human and touching, I think, about whistling. What about it speaks to the soul? Oh, that's, that's such a beautiful story. I love that. I think it does speak to people, and I I do have people tell me that they're quite moved by my music sometimes. And I think whistling, it's a human instrument. It comes from us, and so there's something very familiar and yet otherworldly about the sounds. Like, you can hear it, and you can still recognize, like, this human element. Mm. You know, when I think about the history of music, I often think that whistling would have been one of the first... In instances of humans making music or mm. trying to mimic bird song, or, yeah, would have been vocal things and whistling would have been there. Yeah. But yeah, it speaks to us, it's something deep within us. Very elemental. Mm. Hmm, hmm. You told my producer that a lot of people have talked to you about their older relatives being whistling enthusiasts, and you have a theory about why it's like a talent or pastime that younger generations don't engage in as much. What is that theory? I've wondered why it was something the older generation was doing more. And I think, you know, these days when we all have our own portable music devices, we don't have to be (laughs) whistling or humming. Back in the day, if you wanted to carry a tune with you or if you Mm. had something stuck in your head, you would be whistling it. 
So maybe I mean that's my theory. I'm I'm not sure, but no, that's I mean that's really compelling. Yeah. That's really 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 compelling. Like if you want to carry a tune, you you have something stuck in your head and you're not otherwise engaged. Mm. That's where like whistling can flourish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is so beautiful. <laughs> well, Molly, thank you so much for talking with me today. This has been such a joy. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Okay. So our time with Molly is not done yet because she's got a very special live performance just for us after the break. Stick around. Okay, so after our interview wrapped up, Molly headed into one of our bigger studios at the New York Bureau where her guitarist, Jackson Clifford Fitzgerald, was waiting for her. And from the other side of the glass, the IBAM team, our engineers, and I watched this mesmerizing performance. This is our first song, On the Lips. This one's Oceanic Feeling.
That was Molly Lewis and her guitarist, Jackson Clifford Fitzgerald. Her album, On the Lips, is out now. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Discover. Here's a familiar situation. You have a question about your credit card. You call the number for help and can't get a hold of anyone. If only you had a Discover card. With 24-7 U.S.-based live customer service from Discover, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, you heard that right. A real person. Get the customer service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. These days, it can feel like the news is fighting for your attention wherever you turn, but staying informed shouldn't be a battle. Everything you need to navigate the stories that matter to you is at your fingertips. The NPR app cuts through the noise, bringing you local, national, and global coverage No paywalls, no profits, no nonsense. Download the NPR app in your app store today, or you can go to npr.org slash app. From your car radio to your smart speaker, NPR meets you where you are in a lot of different ways. Now we're in your pocket. Download the NPR app today. Hey, Brittany. Hey, Brittany. Hey, Brittany. Hey, Brittany. This is Alex. And I'm just wondering, have you heard of JoJo Siwa's new song? I heard that she said that she's inventing gay pop or that she has invented gay pop. Um, Have we heard of Kim Petras? Thank you. Oh, my gosh, Alex. Thank you so much for calling in with this question. So for those of you who don't know, JoJo Siwa is a singer and dancer. She became known for the dancing first. She was one of the children on the show Dance Moms, the popular reality TV show. She had this kind of, uh, for those of you who may be old enough to remember, rainbow bright aesthetic. She always had this really tight side ponytail, bright blonde hair, lots of energy, big, big dance moves. And she was always wearing these outfits that reminded me like if Lisa Frank had come to life. Cut to today. She is 20 years old and she is like in the moment where she's transitioning into like whatever the first iteration of her adult celebrity persona is going to be. And boy, oh boy, has it been interessante. So she's done a few things to mature her image a little bit. She's begun dressing, not always in like the, the big rainbow sparkly stuff. She's like cut her hair. She came out a few years ago. And she's been more open about her relationships that she's had with other women. And so she's opening more of her true self up to the public. And it's coming out in the music in a really interesting way. I'd never heard a Jojo Siwa song in my life until I heard Karma. It sounds like a pop song from about 12 years ago. And I think it's about cheating. I haven't been able to really assess the lyrics because I have been so caught up in the way that Jojo Siwa has chosen to perform the choreography with this song. There's a very popular clip that's gone around of Jojo. If somebody's hitting it at a 10, she's going to hit it at 150. So she's doing a little much in the dancing, which has gotten people to kind of, you know, give her some flack on social media. But as for this whole inventing gay pop comment... To clarify, JoJo did say in an interview that she told her team that she wanted to, quote, start a new genre of music. And when they asked what she meant, that's when she said it's called gay pop. When she goes on to explain what she meant by gay pop, she cites a bunch of songs from like Lady Gaga and Miley Cyrus, which I get what she's trying to say, I think, like pop that is popular with gay audiences. But It's not coming together for me. And I think it didn't come together for a lot of people because just that one comment about her saying that she wanted to invent a new genre called gay pop took off online and the comments followed. There have been queer pop artists who have been making music and been really popular for decades now. And so uh, some of Jojo Siwa's commentary does display a lack of understanding of history. But I mean, who at 20 is fully aware of everything that came before them? There's another aspect to it as well, which is that I don't think the general public is necessarily buying this version of JoJo as like a more mature adult. And well, I have a couple thoughts about that. 
it's pretty common for child stars to want to break the mold of their childhood stardom and move into a more adult kind of look or sound or space. But I kind of think that that could be a good thing. If all of these things still feel transgressive to Jojo Siwa, maybe it's kind of a good thing that at 20, she thinks that like cursing publicly is a big deal. Or that she thinks that, you know, switching up her look from rainbow sparkles and sequins to all black sparkles and sequins is like a major shift. It's kind of remarkable after spending basically her entire childhood growing up before all of America. So Jojo Siwa, girl, good luck. Alex, thank you so much for calling in with this question. I don't know if you're going to be bumping karma this week or weekend, but it's clear somebody has been because I'm telling you I cannot escape this song on any type of algorithm that I touch. So yeah, thank you so much for calling in with this and have a great weekend. If you have a thought or question about pop culture, send us a voice memo at ibam at npr.org. That's I-B-A-M at npr.org. This episode of It's Been a Minute was produced by Corey Antonio Rose. This episode was edited by Jessica Placek. Engineering support came from Phil Edfors. Our executive producer is Verilyn Williams. Our VP of programming is Yolanda Sanguini. All right, that's all for this episode of It's Been a Minute from NPR. I'm Brittany Luce. Talk soon. This is Felix Contreras, one of the co-hosts of Alt Latino, the podcast from NPR Music where we discuss Latinx culture, music, and heritage with the artists that create it. Listen now to the Alt Latino podcast from NPR. The news can feel incredibly overwhelming. For a breath of much-needed fresh air, head to NPR.org's culture section. From the buzzy movies, tiny desk, and artists that everyone seems to know about, type in NPR.org for the latest and greatest in the pop culture universe. The NPR app cuts through the noise, bringing you local, national, and global coverage. No paywalls, no profits, no nonsense. Download it in your app store today.